Well, if you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to read verses 42 through 47 uh, before I pray. And like I said in the announcements, we're going to start a new series today called Community. And so we're taking a uh, deep dive into this word and what it means and what the Bible means uh, by this word and and what it should look like in our lives, how we crave it, what we look for, uh, a place to belong, and what that looks like in the church. So I'm really excited about the next few weeks. Um, If you're a a guest with us today, um, I want you to know that I, I normally... Uh, my standard is to preach through a book of the Bible, so we're taking a break right now, and we're going to kind of look and zone in on this word and what it means for us as a church, and then we're going to go back to a book study uh, after this. But thank you for being here today. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This is kind of the base passage for this series. So for the whole series, this is these are the verses, right, that we're going to keep kind of looking at and examining as we talk about this word, community. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. Luke writes this, he says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we know that you have promised to build your church. We know that you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we know that we have the promise of eternity because of salvation and what you've done for us by dying on the cross in our place and raising from the grave to give us a new life. Lord, we have a secure future So I pray as we look to that future in eternity that it would shape the way we live now amongst ourselves and in this world for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Meet Michael, a teenager who loves to play video games. While many of the gamers he plays with are online friends he's never actually met in person, he feels connected to them and and he loves the interaction and sense of belonging he feels when he logs on and, and enters that video game world. Meet Sarah, a college student who is a dedicated member of her sorority And she enjoys the social life and and making lifelong friends. And she really enjoys serving alongside her sisters as they do service projects throughout the city. Meet Jason. Jason is a middle-aged man who works long hours, but he loves his workplace. He loves his office. His closest friends are his co-workers, He tells them everything going on in his life. He he opens up to them and shares his deepest fears with them, his greatest joys with them. They're always there for him. Meet Lynn. Lynn is a retired woman who plays golf every Thursday morning with her ladies group. And it's by far her most favorite time of the week. And even on rainy days, When their outing is canceled, they still, as a group, find a way to get together and hang out, spend time together. Now, what do all of those people have in common? Well, seemingly nothing, right? On the surface, at least, you would say these people have nothing in common. They're they're different ages, different life uh, seasons of life, different lifestyles, yet... 
there's one major common denominator they all share, and that's a desire to belong. A desire to belong, a desire to be loved by others, a desire for a place to fit in, to feel like they can really connect with other people and build true, strong relationships. In other words, you could say, each of those fictitious people I just named, they all have a desire for real community in their lives. You see, when we say the word community, that I want to make sure we're defining what we mean here. The word community, the dictionary says, and the way we're using it, it's, it's a strong feeling of fellowship and belonging with others. A strong feeling of fellowship and belonging with others in your life. And so the point of this series is to examine why we all desire that in the first place. And that's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about today. So today's kind of an introduction into the rest of it. But why do we even desire community in the first place? And then what role, if any, does the church play in this search for community in our lives? So today, I want to talk about why we crave community how we try to find it, and God's design for real community. So let's talk about why we crave community. Now, anytime, this is kind of a good life tip, all right? Anytime you want to learn more about yourself, okay? So through self-introspection, anytime you want to learn more about yourself and who you really are on the inside, a good place to start to examine yourself is by first looking to the person who created you. That's a good place to start. And so ask this question, what is he like? What is God like? And, and did God create me? Did he create you with any of his own resemblances? In other words, did he create you in a way where you're supposed to look like him and, and desire the things that he desires? What is true about your creator that he designed to be true about you as well? Well, one of the most central and foundational truths about God is that he is triune. Triune. In other words, we say it this way, right? God is a trinity. You've heard that word. If you're familiar with church language, you've heard the word Trinity. Now, you're not going to find the word Trinity actually in the Bible, but the Bible as a whole absolutely teaches without a doubt and describes the doctrine of what we call the Trinity. So when we say Trinity, I want to define that the best we can. Uh, so theologian Wayne Grudem, here's how he defines it. Uh, in his book, Systematic Theology. So this is kind of a heavy word here, but here it is. Wayne Grudem says, the Trinity, you could say it this way, God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God, and there is one God. Now, I know that's confusing, and it's okay, because we're not God, okay? He's a different type of being than us, so we can't fathom the, what this really means, it's a mystery. It's okay to admit it's a mystery and we can't fully understand it, but what we must do is affirm it, right? We must affirm this truth as the scriptures teach it and marvel at the greatness of the being of God. That's really what that should do. When we think about how God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in three persons, there is one God, right? That should leave us in awe. I don't understand it, but it's amazing how great the being of God is. So one of the best places in Scripture where we see the Trinity at work is in Mark chapter 1 at the baptism of Jesus. Now you're probably thinking already, he has gone so far off track, what does this have to do with community? Hang on. Mark chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Here we go. And when he came out, out of the waters, so that's Jesus. Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River, right, by John the Baptist. This is the scene. When he, Jesus, came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. 
You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Do you see what's happening at the baptism of Jesus? God the Father is present. Of course, God the Son is present. And God the Holy Spirit is present. There is great insight here in this text into the very nature of God himself. Listen to this. Within the Trinity, within the Trinity, Jesus the Son is sacrificially obedient to the Father's will. The Father loves the Son and approves of him and gives him his blessing. The Holy Spirit is always bringing attention to Jesus the Son and pointing people to him in accordance with God the Father's will. You see, you got it? Everybody write that down? So what do you have? What do you have there? A community. You have a community, a beautiful fellowship within the Godhead three in one. A community of self-giving and self-sacrificial love. God himself is a community of self-sacrificial love. So what does that have to do with your life right now? Everything. It has everything to do with your life, wherever you are, whatever, however you walked into this building this morning, whether you are uh, just having a miserable season of life or a great season of life or just something in between. This has everything to do with where you are and who you are right now. Because look at Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. At the very beginning of time, When God created humans, listen to this. He said, then God said, let us, us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. Image in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. You see, being created in the image of God means that humans, humans are designed to reflect the characteristics of God that he has chosen to share with us. You get to image, you get to reflect the characteristics of your creator as much as he lets us, and this is one way. And what I mean is, look at this, the community of love that is within God himself. He has hardwired us in a way where we all long for that. We all long for that kind of self-sacrificial love in our lives. We want it. We need it. We need it. We need all that kind of strong fellowship and those strong relationships. God himself put that craving inside of you when he made you. Because you reflect who he is. You want to be loved and accepted? Guess what? God gave you that desire. You want to feel like you belong somewhere? God put that desire inside of you. We crave community in our lives because we are created in the image of a God who within himself is a community of love. Father, Son, and Spirit, each person is fully God. There is one God. Theologian Anthony Hokema says this in his book, Created in God's Image, says this about Genesis 127 that we just read, right? So he created them, male and female, he created them in his image. He says, what is being said in this verse is that the human person is not an isolated being who is complete in himself or herself, but that he or she is a being who needs the fellowship of others, who is not complete apart from others. He goes on to say, men and women cannot attain to true humanity in isolation. We are social beings. Man cannot be truly human apart from others. It is only in fellowship with others that we grow and mature. So true. Because 
God designed us that way. This is why we crave community. Our creator designed us that way. It's all a reflection of who he is. It's all a reflection of his love. So that's why, that's why all humans are looking for somewhere to belong. Whether it's your online gaming buddies, whether it's your Thursday morning golfing group, whether it's just the people at your workplace, it doesn't matter. We're all looking for the same thing because it's been hardwired in us by our creator himself. But how are we doing? How are we doing in searching that out? How are we trying to feel that longing, that void inside of us for community, to be loved, to be accepted, to be known, to share our lives with others? Are we finding real community? Well, that's the next thing I want to talk about. How do we search? So, so we see that we crave it, right? We crave it because we're created in the image of a, of a God who is a community of love himself, but, but how are we searching for that? <laughs> now, listen, <clears throat> I wouldn't call myself a coffee snob, okay? But I do enjoy good coffee, though my wife would say I put so much creamer in the coffee, it doesn't even matter what kind of brand or type it is. It's true. She drinks hers black, all right? I drink mine real frou-frou, so it's okay. So, look, I like Starbucks, okay? And I know some of you have been enlightened, okay? And you think Starbucks is gross, and you only drink organic chai lattes from local coffee shops. Whatever, that's fine, all right? I'm not going to judge you if you don't judge me. Are we good? Okay? (laughs) But listen, here's the thing. I was on Starbucks website this week. I know that sounds weird. Prepping for my sermon, okay, that's why. But there was something I found on Starbucks website this week that I really I really think it's interesting. I want, to, I want you to listen to this, all right? This is from Starbucks. They say this. From the beginning, Starbucks set out to be a different kind of company. One that not only celebrated coffee, but also connection. We're a neighborhood gathering place, a part of your daily routine. You're going to go broke if you go there daily, but it's okay. <laughs> Listen to this. Our mission, this is what they say, our mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And one of their core values is this, creating a culture of warmth and belonging where everyone is welcome. Now, if I hadn't have told you that was Starbucks, you probably would think I was reading from a local church's website about their mission and values, right? But even they get it. They get it. Even this large corporation is observant enough to realize that everyone is looking for a place to belong where everybody knows your name, right? And again, our desire, our desire to belong is evidence that we're created in the image of God himself. And this all sounds great, but except for one big problem. Look on the screen, Isaiah 59, verse 2. The beginning of this verse, Isaiah says, but your iniquities, or your sin, have made a separation between you and your God. You see, the problem is our sin separates us from our Creator. Our own choice to rebel against His good design for our lives, our own choice to live for ourselves, for the glory of myself instead of the glory of Him through obedience to Him, my choice The Bible calls that sin, and it's because of our sin, without salvation through Jesus and adoption into God's family, left alone, apart from the community of God and his family, left in our sinful state, we are isolated from God himself. We are not in community, you could say, not in fellowship with God. So if you're not right with God, 
then you can't really experience the deepest form of community as it was designed by God himself to be experienced. Does that make sense? In other words, nothing else in this world is ever going to satisfy ultimately the longing you have to belong and to feel loved and to feel accepted if you do not have communion first with the one who made you. Ultimately, God designed us to find our ultimate belonging and community first in Him and secondarily, you know where else? With other believers. With other people who've been united by His blood. Who share the common bond of God's grace. But for someone who's not in a relationship with God, for someone who is not in communion with God, not a part of His community, His family, then you are left scrambling to find any other means of community in this world, wherever you can get it. In John chapter 4, there's a good illustration of this, a real historical account of an interesting conversation Jesus has with a woman who was a social outcast of her time, of her day, in the ancient world. A Samaritan woman, desperately looking to romantic relationships, one after the other, to find her sense of belonging. To find that community that she craved, just like us. Yet, those romantic relationships never satisfied her desire. Hence, why she would just go through one after the other, looking for the one that would finally stick. Then she met Jesus. She met Jesus while drawing her daily water supply from a well. Listen to this part of the conversation he had with her. John chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Jesus said to this woman, so desperately looking for love, acceptance, belonging, and community, He says this, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She doesn't get it, right? She thinks Jesus is talking about some magical water somewhere. Another well that he found. But you see, this woman had an innate thirst for love and belonging in her life, which is a good thirst. That's given to us by God. We've already talked about that, right? But she was trying to find it in relationships with Men, instead of ultimately seeing the love and acceptance of her God, the love and acceptance of her Savior, Jesus, as the ultimate fulfillment of that thirst. But hey, let's, let's not judge her too quickly, right? See, for her, it was romance, but what is it for you? Where are you searching for belonging and acceptance right now? Now, in a world, in the world we live in, I think we just have to address this. I think a lot of us are searching on social media. I think a lot of us think we have more friends than we do because of social media. Do you, do you judge your sense of, of belonging and acceptance by how many followers you have or how many likes you get on Snapgram or Instachat or whatever. (laughs) I know the names, but you know. Facebook, listen, Facebook itself is really, it's really an amazing phenomenon. I mean, it really is. It's one of the most amazing (laughs) phenomenons in human history in in terms of cultivating a false sense of community, right? And, and, And belonging. Because it makes us think that we have connected with people. I just realized this sermon is going to get censored. Uh, we, <laughs> we think we are connected with people 
just because we, we saw online, right? We saw online, you know, what uh, my aunt had for breakfast and who's, you know, this grandma posts 500 pictures of their grandkids before lunch, okay? I get it. My mom does that. And it's okay. That's good. It's not a bad thing. Again, it's just proof we're all looking for connection and community. But it's such a false sense of it. Look, at best, at surface level, right? You see, I'm picking on social media. And I have Facebook. You can please add me as a friend later today. But it could be anything. I want to be clear. It could be anything, and we all struggle. It could be romantic relationships. It could be social media. It could be just bars, country clubs, being a part of a sports team, a special interest group, the political party that you associate with, your school, your office, your workplace, almost anything, anywhere, any place, any place where two or three are gathered. You can have community. But now I want to be clear, right? A, a lot of these places and, and people and activities where we find community are, are good things. Of course, of course, it's good for you to find community at your school and your office and, and wherever. Absolutely, that's good. But the question is, are we putting all of that, are we putting all of that ahead of our communion with God himself and his people? Where are we looking to feel the deepest desire of longing, of belonging, and acceptance? You know, the examples I shared at the beginning, those are, those are good things. Places where people can find healthy community, absolutely. But if those places and those people are the only, are the only way you're trying to connect with others, at some point, they will fail you. At some point, they will not provide what you really need. At some point, you could say it this way, you'll be thirsty again. Let's talk, let's close with God's design for real community. So we talked about why we crave it. We talked about how we search for it in the world today. But what is God's real design for authentic community? Well, as I've already said, the ultimate, the ultimate fulfillment of this longing is in relationship with God himself, right? And if, and if that is, and, and that is only possible through Christ's love to us through his death and resurrection. So you see, we were, we were spiritually isolated and alone, but Jesus, what did he do for us to bring us into the community of God? Jesus experienced Complete isolation and abandonment on the cross. Perhaps your greatest fear, he experienced for you and died for it on the cross. Jesus experienced the wrath and the abandonment of God, the Father, on the cross so that we could live in his community forever. Well, that's a good exchange. He took our place. He experienced the greatest loneliness and isolation on the cross so that you would never have to eternally. What great love is that? Our sinfulness separates us from God, but through faith in Christ, Romans 8.1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. There's no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. If you have turned away from yourself being the Lord of your life, yourself being the King of your life, and you've turned to Christ to be everything for you. There's no condemnation for you now. It's done. Your sin is crucified. It has been killed. That doesn't mean that you're not still going to make mistakes. You will still make mistakes. You will still sin. But the penalty, the legal payment, has been paid. 
And out of that gratitude we have for the Lord and what he's done for us, what do we do? We want deeper communion with God. And as we experience deeper communion with God, we're going to want deeper communion with his people, his family, his community. Paul said it. Paul said in, in Romans 8, this is just so beautiful, 8 verses 38 and 39, he said, For I am sure that neither death nor life, l- listen to how decisive this is, how permanent this is, neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to leave us stranded again, will be able to leave us in isolation will be able to leave us alone. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's permanent. God created us to experience communion with him and each other. Sin messed that up. But Christ rescues us. He brings us into eternal communion with God and with everyone else in the family of God. See, next week we're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about this place as a community. You, me, all of us together as the design that God made to reflect who he is to the world. His image bearers, that's who we are. Redeemed by his blood, united together by his blood. Showing a world that is longing and desperate for a place to belong. Showing them what the ultimate solution to that is. God himself and his people, his family, his body, his kingdom. So we're going to take a deep dive into that next week. Please don't miss that. Please be here for that. But I want to say to you today, if if you are looking for a place to belong, I want to invite you first and foremost to know Jesus. Belong to him. Give yourself to him. Experience the fulfillment of love and acceptance that nothing else in this world can give you. The grace and forgiveness for all you've ever done. If you're experiencing great guilt and shame over your past and you don't think you're worthy, you don't think you're worthy to belong in the community of God. You don't think you're worthy to belong in communion, in a relationship with God himself. Guess what? You're right. You don't deserve it. And I don't deserve it either. That's the point. None of us deserve it. I'm not any better than any of you. But there's something called grace. There's something called grace. God's grace and forgiveness given to us through his payment for our sins. And if you repent, that means turn away. If you turn away from your sin and you trust Jesus to be your Savior today, then you can experience real communion with the one who knitted you in your mother's womb. The one who knows you better than you know yourself. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you alone. His presence will always, always be with you. You will always be in his community. If you're looking for a church home to belong to, I encourage you to please come and talk with me or one of our pastors after the service today. We would would love to answer whatever questions you may have. If you want to talk about baptism and what that means, we would love to talk with you about that. Any questions you may have. But if you're looking for a place to belong, please do not hesitate to come and ask. We would love to talk with you. We would love to meet with you and just sit down and get to know you better. And hopefully, we could see the community of God continue to build through that. Thank you for being here this morning. Kyle's going to close us out in a song. But I want to pray. I want you to join me in prayer as we ask the Lord to open our eyes. As we dive deep next week, we're going to go deep into what this word really means.
for us as a church. But would you pray with me now for the Lord to open our eyes and see how we are incorrectly searching for community, perhaps in the wrong places, or perhaps good places and good people and good things, but we've elevated them above our communion with God himself. Would we pray about that right now? Lord, we thank you that you gave up everything. You gave up everything. Jesus, you isolated yourself on the cross. The Father turned his face away and you experienced total abandonment. You were forsaken so that we could be known. Lord, you were forsaken so that we could be loved. So Lord, every single one of us in here, we know, we know what it's like to be lonely. We know what it's like to feel like no one is on our side. We know the deepest, darkest pits of that despair. But Jesus, may we know right now in this moment the greatest heights of your love. That you are really, for real, committed and present in our lives. And that you love us unconditionally. Lord, would you make that truth so real in our hearts? Lord, let it motivate us to seek deeper fellowship with you this week as we prepare to talk about our relationships with one another next week. Lord, may we first start this week getting ourselves right with you. Would you prepare our hearts in that way? Would you do that in us? Holy Spirit, as your family, as your body. Would you bring us back next week as we learn more and bring glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Stand.